All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back for another Boca podcast episode. And uh, I was just giving this guy major props before we even started recording. I'm excited to have Sean Lee with me here today. Sean, thanks for doing the show with me. Man, I appreciate. Thank you for having me, Nathan. Man, this is this is awesome. Well, yeah, I can't wait. I, me too. I'm, I'm excited now. And in case anybody listening and can't hear, I'm literally smiling. Uh, but I, I posted earlier on social media today, and then I told you just like a minute or two ago. Um, one of the things that I just I love about you, Sean, is your energy. Um, and, and I know there's this phrase, in fact, we should start with this. There's this phrase that you say that ultimately named the conference that we're going to talk about as well. Rock that where, where did, where, and when did you start saying that phrase? Man, uh, rock that. Listen, I don't even know if you have enough time on this podcast for me to get through. (laughs) No, but, but really, um, so what many people don't know is before, man, before I became a professional photographer, my life had many, many turns, right? And so I was a uh, forklift truck driver in, uh, in a warehouse, man, for 12 years of my life. Wow. And so I, I worked in warehousing and did shipping and receiving and logistics and all of that stuff. And I think that that stuff actually helped me in business as a photographer and a creative. But let me tell you real quick where Rock That came from, dude. And, and it's a story, I'm going to tell you. Okay. So... While I was driving these forklift trucks, man, we would be in the busy season and busy season was Christmas time. And so we would literally have 60, 53 foot trailers a day that we had to unload. Oh, wow. And, and there was no such thing as you don't finish it today. Everything by the end of the workday had to be unloaded. And so there were many times 12 hour, 14 hour, 16 hour days because we had to get the job done. So failure was not an option. Okay. So the warehouse is like a block long and driving a forklift all day long, dude, you literally get cramps in your legs from mashing on the gas pedal. And we would encourage our team would encourage each other. And so the, the warehouse is a block long. So we had a guy that was set up in the middle of the uh, warehouse. And as we were running back and forth from trucks and putting product away, we would yell. Now, it wasn't rock that, but they would yell, run that. We'd be like, run that, baby. Come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> we would literally hype each other, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so early in my career, uh, my saying started out as started out as run that because just failure was just not an option. So any anything I ever faced, any opposition I ever faced, my, ta- my tagline was always, but baby, let's go. We're going to run that. We don't have an option to fail, so we're not going to do it. We're going to find a way to make it happen. Yeah. And that came from warehousing for me. Well, in the middle of, uh, of all of that and uh, becoming a professional photographer, man, the other part of that story is growing up as a kid, I used to watch, you know, we had black and white TV um, back then. And, and I could not as a as a young black kid growing up in the, um, in the, in the ghettos, man, I would watch TV and you would watch these rock bands after they finished their set, okay. they would break, they would break guitars on the stage. Yeah. 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 Right? And as a, as a young, as a young black boy, I, it, I could not fathom why would somebody take a perfectly good guitar and break it on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. But what I what I what I came to learn and, and understand is that they sold out. They sold out to it, right? They were so into what they were doing that money, we're gonna rock this set out. And after we done, we're gonna break the guitars on the stage. We're gonna jump in the mosh pit and we're gonna leave it all on the stage. And when we do the next show, we'll just have to get some new guitars. But for this show, we leaving it all on the stage. Wow. Um, literally. And so literally. And so that's when um life took the term rock that for me. It was it was failure is just not an option. Yeah. Money, we're gonna leave it all out on the floor. We're gonna leave it out on the stage. I'm gonna give it everything that I got. Failure is not an option. And money, we're gonna break the guitars on the stage. We're gonna jump in the mosh pit and and we not stop it. Right. And so that's where the term um, rock that came from. It, it says that to anybody who is wanting to accomplish anything in life, my answer to them is going to be rock that money. We may need to strategize it. We let's get it together. But my answer to you is always going to be let's let's rock it out. If you want to do it, it can be done. Can't nothing on, on earth stop you. I love it. I mean, we could literally, we we could just end the podcast right now. And I think (laughs) our listeners would seriously have like enough energy just listening to you to walk away and go do something. I'd love that. You know, and and I actually just 
kind of threw this out there on on uh, Instagram uh, just what two days ago, but I was talking about the significance of doing because there was a it's easy and and I've been guilty of it as well. It's easy to talk. It's another thing to do. And yes. one of the things that enables us to be able to do and to do consistently as well, you know, because it's it's one thing to show up once or twice. It's another thing to actually go for it consistently. To be able to do that, you have to have a, a passion. Um, and it sounds cliche, but it, really, it's an energy that drives us. That energy, though, has to come from somewhere. And, and one of the things I'm a pretty big fan of Tony Robbins and, and the way that he has kind of simplified and mainstreamed psychology for for people. Yes. And one of the things he talks about is the significance of belief systems. Uh, that ultimately, you know, when we when we truly believe in something, we buy into it to the extent that it can ultimately affect us emotionally, uh, oh. and then that emotion translates to action. So I'm curious yeah. to understand what are and and maybe I will tie this into my first question because I normally ask about brand position, but I, I I get the sense that maybe at least some of this passion that you exhibit so consistently comes from the brand position statement that I actually see on your Instagram page. And for everybody listening in, if you go to Sean, S-H-A-W-N-L-E-E, Sean Lee Studios on Instagram, we'll link to it in the show notes. Sean says he's a creative influencer that opens doors for all cultures. And this ties into what we're going to get into a little bit later. But would you say that that mission is what gives you that that energy, that passion for what you do? Absolutely. Um, I would say absolutely. And so when we say all cultures, I would even like to break that down further and just say people. Okay. Period. Okay. Um, I have a love, dude. I just have a love for people. Yes. Um, and, and it comes from my roots as a, I'm a good old fashioned church boy. Um, I love God and I love people. And so, uh, my mission is, is to serve, right? Mm. That, that, that I believe is my mission. Now, I happen to be a photographer and I happen to do it full time. And so how do I serve? Well, I serve in in my industry. I serve photographers. So if I'm going to do anything in life, the basis of it is going to be service. And it is what drives me. Right. It is what gives me the energy because it's not about um, it's not about opening doors for Sean. It really is about opening doors for um, for other people, man. And so that has been the basis of everything that we do. And it's the reason that we go hard in the paint. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to ask you, too, because you mentioned the word serve. And I actually had a conversation uh, on this podcast with Anna and Ryan Leonard. We can link to it in the show notes for anybody who's curious. But um, they they come from a, a church background as well. So do I. The, the word service um, or serve is is a pretty common word in those circles, but I'm curious, you know, for, for somebody maybe who doesn't go to church or doesn't have a church background, how does that, how can we define that work? Because during that episode, actually, with them, I'm very curious about this topic, uh, because I don't feel like we talk about the significance of service maybe enough in the photography industry. But I, I realize that it also maybe carries some religious connotations for some people that maybe they push that notion away. I'm curious how we can kind of mainstream this idea of service for the sake of the photography industry. And I actually pulled up the word wow. serve in, uh, in a couple of different dictionaries on my phone when we were doing that podcast episode. And it was weird. There wasn't a really great definition for the word. I wonder, I wonder what you or how you would define that word serve. Whew, boy, you just opened up a bunch of stuff. This is a good conversation right here. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you. So serve, when you talk about like, let's, let's, let's make it mainstream, okay. right? Yeah. And so if, if I was to give it a mainstream definition, it would be to, to help, to give, um, to throw yourself in with no expectation of anything in return. Oh, okay. Right. And for me, I guess at a base level, that is what that means, right? It is mission driven. Um, if I could use that term, I, I would use that term. Right. Service is being mission driven and serving the mission no matter what the cost is. And if you and and the second part of that is that if you were to look at that, let's say service from a biblical standpoint back in in Bible days, and I'm not trying to go all deep for your audience and, and you know, they, they're not going to hear organ. Uh, uh, yeah, no worries at all. You know, we're not going <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep we, going. We're not going to the church service. But but servant was a slave. It, it was a slave yeah. um, back then. In, in other words, you were servant to um, something, right? And so to be a servant to people is to be um, slave to people, if that makes sense, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, I, and honestly, I think that's part of 
what's in the back of my mind as well. Like there, there is this, there are some negative connotations associated with that word serve where people were ultimately used, right? And so how do yeah. we, how do we change that? And, and I realize that in some places, I mean, you know, we talk about a server at a restaurant, for example, it's not that people don't ever use the word, but I, I still wonder if there might be more opportunity to, to highlight this word, the significance of it and talk about the very thing I actually was taking notes as you were talking. And I wrote down the three words, give without expectation. I think that mm-hmm. that, and in those three words sum up, at least for me anyway, the definition of serve, especially is the way that you're describing it. Uh, how do we how do we kind of take the negative connotation out of that word, though? I think that um, I think what we just said. Can, can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. And, and let me tell you kind of how this started in the industry for me, man. I was, you know, you work hard, and and as a photographer, you you know, you get your education, all of that stuff, and you buy your equipment, and you set out right. And I, and I found out that it wasn't about um, almost all skill set. It was about also branding and 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 um people understanding who you are. So I put myself out there. And so um, one particular year, it had to be, I don't know, 20, 2012, 2013, 2014. It was somewhere around there, man, where I got the opportunity to speak on a platform at WPPI. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was super excited. Right. And I think that year I was the only man of color speaking at the highest level, yeah. right at the conference. And I was so excited. I was really, really excited, really happy. And then the more I thought about it, the sadder I got and the more I wept because I was the only man of color speaking at the highest mm, level. Yeah. Right. And so I, I've, I've always said this in my life because I hit my head on a bunch of walls uh, coming up in my career and I made a lot of mistakes. I said that if I ever had the opportunity, I was going to help other people. Mm. Right. And so I felt this responsibility to help people. And because I was in the photography industry, that was the industry that I went to work in. And so if we were going to um, mainstream it or or give it a name for other people other than the word service, it would be to to help folk. Like if you get a leg up, right, then reach back down. Yes. You know what I mean? And it is I think it is incumbent upon us to give back and to make sure that um, we perpetuate an industry that is strong. Um, for everybody and the and the generations of professionals and creatives that come behind us, you know what I mean. And the only way you do that is that you give back. You have to, and so you fight hard to give back, um, which is a term that people use often, mm-hmm. right? But as opposed to it being just money, um, give back creatively, give back uh, towards community, right? Give back to young folk coming up in the industry. Yeah. Give away your old stuff, whatever that means that, that helps somebody and does it in a spirit of, um, in a spirit of gratefulness from where you come from, but also that doesn't lean on anybody to have to give anything back to you. I think, I think seeds this good heartedness, right. That, yeah. that can live on for a very long time. Right. And, and perpetuate greatness, um, not only in a community, but in industry. Well, and, and for those of you listening in, and we're going to get into this in more detail in just a bit, but Sean doesn't just say these words, he's actually living it. And I'm, this is really the main reason why I'm, I'm highlighting um, his brand and ultimately the, the conference that he started, because there's just, there's reality behind the words that he's saying to the extent that he's he's doing this in a very, very tangible level and in a way that I've not heard any other photography conference uh, do. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. We're going to come back to. It. I, re- I really appreciate you sharing, Sean. This is already an exciting conversation. Um, we, we, you Locked know, it. the next question that I normally ask has to do with customer experience, but I think we highlighted this this concept of service to the extent <laughs> that I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. I, and talk to me about time, actually, because this, you know, especially in light of the conversation today and and the one that you and I had uh, previously, just the two of us, um, you're talking about all the different things that you have done and have been involved in. I'm curious how you manage time for yourself in such a way that you don't get burnt out, that you're able to still run these brands, but have time for personal relationships and, and rest ultimately. Um, wow. That's a, that dude, that's a great question. So check it. Um, I find oftentimes, um, and, and my team tells me all the time that Sean, you need to slow down. You need to do this. You need to do that, but I'm driven by mission. And so mm. my rest is found within the mission that, that I have. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes much sense to people, but but I I I get my um 
I get my power. I get my, my energy. Yeah. I get my rest knowing that we are accomplishing the work that I've been called to do. Hmm. You know what I mean? And so you tend to make time for the stuff that is extremely important or mission driven. Yes. And I always feel like that, you know, I can rest when, when I need to now from a very, um, logistical standpoint, of course, there are days where I don't do anything. So even running my own business, right? And so when I look up on Sundays and Mondays, I tend to uh, slow it down a bit and handle less intense projects and things of that nature. And and so I manage that way in a sense. And also, you know, as the older I get, knowing that I have to manage my diet and, and, and starting to cut back on junk food and needing to work out more and all of those things also kind of help with that, man. But I'm going to tell you like, dude, foot to the floor. Like when I'm in my element and I'm in the stuff that I'm doing yep. and, and, and I see people thriving yep. and I see businesses taking off, dude, it energizes me any even more. Um, and I tend to go at it a lot more. And in those instances, my rest is there. Mm. My excitement is there. My renewal is um, is in those places. Yeah. You get your energy from that. Uh, it reminds yeah. me, do you follow Gary Vaynerchuk at all? Yes. Yeah. It reminds, yes. It reminds me of him yeah. in, in some ways. He talks about that. This is constant and you see it too. There's just this very yeah. constant and consistent energy and he goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and doesn't really ever seem to stop. And, and yet he maintains that level of passion for what he does. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with, he has these bigger picture, ideas or goals in mind, ones that are bigger than just him on his own. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is largely what is, enables that kind of energy, what drives him. And I, I think you're in a great example of that as well. I'm curious, though, when it comes right. to time, and you talked about your team, do you, well, I mean, if you have a team, naturally, you're going to delegate. Talk to us a little bit about the significance of delegation as it relates to managing these brands, you know, starting a conference. Um, how, what is the, the role, I guess, that delegation plays in the management of your brands? Oh, it's huge. Um, cause I'm gonna tell you, man, let, let me be very honest. You know, when, you know, I came up hustling, you know, my whole life. Yeah. So it's very difficult for me. It w it was starting out. It was very difficult for me to delegate, right? I had my hands on, on everything. And so I have learned to, uh, give stuff off to people, which is why it's important to have a team of people that you trust that you believe in, that you like, right? And, and that you know kind of carries your heart as far as what we do. And so, um, dude, it has been, it, it's been, dude, it's been the ultimate having to hand off to the team and trust them and empower them to be able to do that. And then not worry about it, man, because, dude, I will fall flat on my face. Um, and believe me, I have, you know I mean? Yeah. I have before. And yeah. So the success of serving people is to surround yourself with like-minded people. You know what I mean? And for me, they don't have to be perfect. They just have to uh, have a passion about what we're doing. Yeah. And I believe that they can learn anything and do anything. You know, it's funny. I was just having a conversation with somebody uh, very uh, along the same lines um, because we're in the process right now of looking for somebody to fill a role uh, in our company. And it's really not just one brand. It's multiple brands. Uh, but that was a very similar thing that I was saying. I, I, I could see kind of the bigger picture, and it was beyond just skill set. And a lot of it mm -hmm. does have to do what's kind of on the inside, right? The mind, the heart. Uh, yep. and, and ultimately, like you're talking about, the, the, the level of passion and commitment. If that is there, skills can be learned. And I said to that person, I'm like, you know, the, <laughs> so much of what I've done has just been, you know, me on Google doing a search and trying to figure something out on my own. It's not because I'm that yeah. smart. You just, you, you work <laughs> it out. You figure it out. That's right. Rock that. Yeah, man. Dude, commitment to, you know what I found? The people that I love to have on the team are people who are committed to mission, right? When we outline mission and we say that it is our mission to make sure that people have an opportunity to grow, uh, to go full-time in photography if they desire to, um, and to serve people with our whole heart with no expectation of anything in return, people who are committed to that, figure it out. I don't care how smart they are. I don't mm. care what they know, what they don't know. I, I will ride or die with people like that. You know, and, and, and we have done, we've done okay, man. And so rock that. <laughs> that's know? great. No, that's really great. Money. I, um, let me, let me jump to the next question. Books. Yes. Um, have you found inspiration through books, whether business books, self-help books that you've read or listened to over the years? Is there, and if so, is there a particular one that maybe stands out that you'd recommend? 
So there is a book that I have read that I read years ago that is always my go-to. It's probably one of my favorites. It, it's the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership Yes, by John Maxwell. Yeah, yeah. Um, I absolutely love that book, right? You know, um, John says stuff in that book like leadership um, is influence, nothing more, nothing less, mm. right? It's uh, what you attract is not determined by what you want. It's determined by who you are. You know what I mean? It's those types of things, right? It's improvement is is impossible without change. Mm. Um, it it is making sure you touch somebody's heart before you ask them um, for a hand. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, those types of things. So th- those are some of the things that I kind of uh, live by, and and those are for me also kind of biblical principles that that I um, that I live by. And I'm a, like I said, man, I'm a good old fashioned church boy who loves people. Yeah, and it's always been in me to serve people and to give people everything that I got. And so, man, I do. I love the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. I would certainly recommend that book. Well, and we're definitely going to link to it uh, for our listeners. If you haven't read that book, and I, it's come up maybe once or twice, one or two other times on the show, um, but we'll, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. For those of you listening in, if you just go to bocapodcast.com, you can see the show notes for this episode, the resources, um, links, talking points, et cetera, will all be there. And uh, if you use a podcast app that has show notes, of course, you can take advantage of the show notes there as well. I want to jump back to, to something you mentioned before we get into kind of the meat of, of our conversation today, Sean. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned the significance of, of hustle in your life, and this is something that you're used to. It's a concept you're used to. And yet, I'm also curious to maybe push back a little bit and kind of get your take on hustle as it relates to effectiveness of so-called hustle, if you will, and, and maybe put a better way. Mm. It, it's very easy for us to be busy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or to mm-hmm. just do things uh, for the sake of so-called hustle or being busy. But at the end of the day, if we're not doing things that actually have leverage, that actually create movement for the sake mm-hmm. of our companies, it, we're, we're kind of spinning our wheels in a sense. So I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, uh, I know that you're just naturally a driven person, but do you do you have you been able to find a balance between that so-called hustle and then making sure that the things that you're hustling uh, in, the things that you're doing, actually create uh, or make a difference? Uh, th- yeah, dude, that's a that is a. I love the way you approach that, right? Because um, for a lot of my career, it has been nothing but hustle um, and not much momentum, mm. right? And so, but those are teachers. You know what I mean? I think I found it at a point uh, when, uh, you know, you hustle because you have to hustle. And the the goal at that time was to, we got to make ends meet. And so you hustle to make ends meet and you you get to the point where you get used to making ends meet. And so you hustle for ends meet until yeah. you start to, until you, until you start to see that, you, you know, this is getting tiring and I'm spinning my wheels and you start to strategize. And the more that you learn and the more that you grow, I think the more that you start to add strategy to your hustle and making sure that you're not expending um, unneeded energy, but actually maximizing the energy that you put into certain projects. Fair. So sitting down and planning that stuff out is something that's learned over time. Yeah. And so when you start doing research and doing numbers, and this is one of the things that I challenge um, all the photographers and stuff that are coming up under MAP. Um, and starting businesses and all of that stuff is that you you can't get out there and just be shooting like crazy and not have a plan. And so one of the first things that I ask them is, how much money do you want to make this year? Yep. Right. I, I just asked them a simple question and they always say to me, I don't know. Mm. I said, well, then why are you why are you photographing everything under the sun? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, they say, well, Sean, I have a problem with pricing. Why do you have a problem with pricing? What do you want to make this year? Yeah. And so I challenge, for example, I challenge people to say, if that's, I tell them to give me a number, right? I don't know what that is. Give me a number. What do you want to make? What did your job pay you, right? And then how much do you want to make? Is that 30? Is that 50? Is it $100,000 this year? Because if it's $100,000 this year, um, then that will determine how much you need to make per month. It will also determine how much you need to make per week. It will determine how many sessions you need to do. It will determine what you set your session pricing at. It will determine the type of photography that you get into. Yeah. Right. And you can now start to strategize and plan out what life will look like and what your business will look like. And then you can start to target your energy um, in certain 
in certain areas, certain directions, or even during certain types of shoots only. And so I always tell my photographers that to, to concentrate on high profit, uh, low energy type of uh, sessions, stuff that will make you the most amount of money with the, with the least amount of, uh, of energy or investment in. Yeah. Right. And when they start thinking of it that way and they start thinking uh, about it business wise, as opposed to just shooting everything in the sun, they often come out with with totally different outcomes um, for, you know, what they end up doing and how they decide to make money as a business. I love the way that you break that down there for a couple of reasons. One, there have been a lot of questions in the photography industry over the years about pricing. And I felt like photographers have kind of overcomplicated that process of determining how to price their services, because at the end of the day, they need to make a certain amount in order to, you know, pay bills. And, mm-hmm. and so the way that you, that you just broke that down, I think is perfect. How much do you need to make in a year and then take steps backward and, and break that down month to month, week to week. And then of course that will help determine how much you're charging for a session, which naturally then will help determine your target market, how you yep. market, um, and I, I love that, but we talk a lot about the, the, the idea of a, a big picture view here on the podcast. And, and when, when I define a big picture view, I mean, this is a, the phrase I, I borrowed from a book called time management from the inside out, Julie Morgenstern. But the way that I allude to big picture view is, um, it, it's made up of, of a number of components, one of which certainly is our income. The second component though, is how much time we want to spend making that money. Um, because for me, time is super, super important. Um, I, I want to, I want to make a comfortable living, but I also don't want to work 80 hours a week. Right. So yes. how, how do I, how do I make X amount, um, in a certain amount of time for me, let's, let's call it a, an average of about 25 to 30 hours a week, um, that I want to, to allocate toward so-called work because it, in my mind, there's more to life than just work. Uh, and so if that's the case, how much do I need to make an hour? Uh, in order to make this amount that I want to net at the end of the year. And taking the time to break that down can be super helpful. It gives you a so-called big picture view to then aim for. And you can kind of run everything else through that filter. These are the things, first of all, these are the values that I want to live out in my life. As a result, yep. this is the type of business that I want to run. This business, I need to be able to make this much money with. So this is the business model that I need to create, which naturally determines the pricing and so on and so forth. But unless they take the time to establish, as you were pointing out, Sean, that bigger picture view, which at the very least can start with how much money they need to make in a year, they're just going to be kind of flailing and, and randomly doing this thing and that thing and wasting a lot of time spinning their wheels. And it ends up in a lot of frustration, unfortunately. Yes. Yes. That's the truth. Um, you want to know what I figured out? And this was that this was, these were lessons learned over time, man. For example, so I do, I have a high, I teach a lot of high school senior um, photography, right? Oh, I, I love that. It. I shoot high school senior photography, right? And so what I learned over time is when I started out is that I didn't have a studio, but I rented time, right? And this is one of the things that I teach people. And I, I don't know, I, it seems to blow people away, right? And so I used to spend a lot of time, uh, two, three hours photographing a high school senior, and then spend way too much time post-producing, right? Yep. You shoot three hours, you shoot, you know, I don't know, five, 600 photos, whatever. And you spend way too much time post-producing. And then I, I started to figure out how I have to, this is too much and I'm not making any money, right? So I have to refine this process and this workflow so that it makes me money. And so I only do 50 seniors a year right now. The minimum investment is $1,000 and the average customer spends between two and $3,000, right? right? Um, only 50 seniors a year. Now, I average about five hours per senior right now. Five hours total per senior. That is... That is initial phone call and consultation. That is the hour session that we do. That is post-production. That is sales session. That is final output, final delivery, and done five hours per senior. When I did the math on that, when you take five hours per senior and you do 50 seniors a year, five times 50 is what, 250 hours? When you divide that by an eight-hour workday, that is about 30 uh, close to 31 days time. So I can make a minimum of a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in 31 days time. Wow. Right. So when you start to look at it that way as a business and start to work through how you can innovate the ways that you 
um, make money and think about your 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 photography as a business and not just a creative thing that you love to do, mm. um, then you can have a creative thing that you love to do that can actually take care of you and maximize your time at the same time. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, we'll leave that yeah. alone. I mean, that could really be a podcast episode in and of itself, but yeah. <laughs> it, you, you really did communicate it in such an easy to, to follow, easy to understand way for all of our listeners. I really appreciate that. Maybe we'll Rock come back it. to that on a different day, but let's keep going okay. because I really want to really kind of continue our earlier conversation in a sense, but I want yes, to sir. highlight what you're doing with your conference, uh, the Rock That Conference, and we'll link to this in the show notes for anybody who's curious. And of course, I'll let Sean share a few more details about the conference when the next one is. But um, yes. you started this conference and also started, you, met, you alluded to MAP just a second ago. Uh, maybe you can just give a kind of an introduction, if you will, to what MAP is and, and the Rock That Conference and where they came from. What is the backstory? Um, wow. So seven years ago, um, there's this gentleman named Ralph Romaguerra who was past P, uh, president of PPA, and he really wanted to see um, diversity in the industry of uh, photography. And yeah. so I had attended a meeting at, a, uh, at an Imaging USA, and, um, and I inquired um, of a guy named Mike Fulton. So Mike Fulton was on the board of the PPA at the time. And yeah. I said, Look, Mike, uh, how do we start this process? And Mike was like, dude, um, let's let me do some inquiries and start turning, start seeing if we can turn some wheels. And so long story short, we became an affiliate of the PPA, which is called the Multicultural Association of Professional Photographers Very cool. um, map. And it's built around education, business, inspiration, outreach and community. And I believe that these are all of the things that a photographer needs to be successful, not just photography education, right? So developing the entire person um, and building that around something that serves community, that outreaches to people. Um, you have to be inspired in order to learn, right? And it's one thing to be a photographer. It's another thing to be a business owner. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when, when people are coming into it, at, at least in my culture, right, with uh, a lot of folk, they love photography. They love to be able to composite. But photography is a very technical, a very technical craft, right, yeah. that a lot of people don't grasp. A lot of people take their camera and they put it on automatic. And they take a thousand shots and they hope they get three. You know what I mean? And so taking people through the process of actually learning and becoming proficient at your craft takes a, a community that will surround you, right? Encourage you when you get frustrated, right? And be there to help you, help you prepare to take tests, right? If you're serious about really wanting to be a professional, then we want to make sure we have all of the pieces in place that will help you the most to be successful. And so that is what MAP is built around, um, is to open up doors for all people, right? And, and we want to make sure we have a good mix in what we look like and, and who we present to, not just all one color people. And I, and I love that you're, you're emphasizing this, this notion of kind of all-aroundedness, if you will, because you're right, it can't just be business, but it also can't just be inspiration. I've noticed in the last few years or so, there's been a move at, at conferences and workshops toward a lot of focus on so-called inspiration and there's not a ton of meat to the presentations that I'm hearing from photographers, actionable, practical content that photographers, the attendees can take and go apply as soon as they get home. Uh, yeah. and, and so there's gotta be, there's gotta be a better balance all around, certainly inspiration, but certainly education and then service community. Um, and, and we're going to talk more about what that looks like, but I'd, I'd like that you're emphasizing becoming an all around photographer, a more well-rounded photographer, not just focusing on one thing or the other. Yeah. Because you know, Hey man, you, you have to be right. Because you, you'll run into, you run into walls and pitfalls and things of that nature. And you need to have, um, some foundation up underneath you to carry you through. Yep. One of the things that we do at rock that, and what I'm, uh, what I'm really adamant about is that I, you know, everybody that speaks, you know, I curate, um, everybody. I have a relationship with every person who speaks at Rock That. Not because um, I'm afraid to have the latest and greatest and greatest people. It's that I want to make sure that the people that, that I put before our members 
are going to serve them well. Mm. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, I, I, it is important to me to put before our people, uh, photographers who have seen the ups and downs, right? And understand what it's like, who have fallen out of love and fallen back in love with photography and have seen the ups, the downs, gone through it all and still have experienced success. That is important to me for our people and our young folk to be able to see that and experience that. It's important to me for us to have speakers who, who give their all to our people, right? Because we're serving people. And so because I give my all, I want folk to give their all. And, and not only that, feel good about it. Dude, I can tell you stories of uh, photographers like Terrell Lloyd, who uh, comes and speaks at the Rock That Conference. Yep. He's the head photographer for the San Francisco 49ers and a Canon Explorer of Light. And so Terrell comes, man, and at three in the morning, we we will um, we'll confiscate the hotel lobby television, yeah. and he'll and and he's hooked into it. And three four in the morning, man, you should see the crowd of people and just talking and pouring into that kind of stuff is extremely extremely important to me that we build a community um, who gives back, not just me, not just map, not just rock that, but build a community with the same mindset. So when they go back to their communities, they invest in them and they invest in the young people there and they invest in the older folk there and, 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 and they give back so that they can actually learn and grow um, with their community. Okay. So then, then talk to us about how you're doing this specifically with the rock that conference. Oh, dude. So, of course, it's called Rock That because that is my term for making life happen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so um, what I what what I set out to do was to have a safe space for um, everybody. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there are there are elderly people, the people who are retiring, um, who want to start photography as a skill. Right. They are retiring. They want to get stuff. There are young folk who want to jump into photography. And so I wanted to have a conference where we had a good mix of everybody, right? It was important to me not just to have all black folk or all one culture of people. I wanted to have a good mix of everybody with one mission, right? And that is photography, education, inspiration, um, giving back community and the whole nine so that they could take that and continue that work on their own, right? Mm. And so we established this platform and we we partner with, uh, with entities like schools, like for example, Schoolcraft College, in Michigan is a partner of ours, which is student based. And we come together, we hype people up, we partner with high schools in in the local area, and we bring kids in to inspire them and then learn. And we'll have three days of education, right? We will do three days of education. And what ends up happening is that that first day tends to be photography education, okay? right? It tends to be all photography education all across the board. The second day, um, which is the Saturday, is our photo walks and photo bays where the class that they took before, now you can go and practice the stuff that you just learned the day before. That's good. Right. And so we'll be on the streets of downtown Detroit uh, with everybody who's speaking as a photo walk lead or photo bay lead and allowing people to shoot while they're talking and all of that stuff. And then the third day tends to be business and dismissal so that we make sure that there is a well-rounded thing built around the conference. Yeah. Um, Last year, we did our first women's panel. Oh, it was amazing, Hmm. right? So we had all of the women speakers were on stage doing a live panel to encourage other women photographers. And so they were telling the stories of what they had been through, right? There's one lady um, from Detroit named Piper Carter, who was an editorial photographer Mm -hmm. overseas. She used to get in fist fights with men to get to get photographic position. Wow. Right. Um, and so for, for her to be able to be on stage and tell that story and still be here and still talk about how she loves photography is empowering, yeah. right? Uh, we also do another panel called the Master's Panel where all of the speakers are on a, are on a panel and we allow everybody who's at the conference to send up the questions that they want to ask, um, to send them up on stage. And I moderate it and I ask these questions too. And it's very transparent, man. Mm-hmm. It is some of the coolest stuff you will ever meet. And and we had a speaker one time talk about how photography wasn't all to life and how he had almost lost his life. And it gave him great perspective. And, and for some of the speakers that we have there, that are some of the best in the world to be that transparent with what they've gone through, dude, is so empowering to 
um, folk who see them in a different light. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it, it lets people know that they can do it, that they can get it done as well as do we do um, certification training. Right. We do certification tests at the conference. And right. You're talking so, about like PPA certifications, correct? PPA certification. Yes. So we do we do training all year long. And so one of the uh, the guys who handles our training is Michael South, who is uh, one of our co vice presidents of MAP. And so we do we do training all year round for people to get certified as a professional photographer. And we've had many come through, um, pass the test. And we have a lot that are waiting to take the, the, uh, the second portion of that test, which is the image submission. Uh, we have had a ton of people become CPPs, right? We've had a ton of people fail the test several times and we've been there by their side while they go over it and go over it and go over it again until they pass the test. Right. It, it is it's literally a community to get them to a place of professionalism. Mm. Right. And so we try our very hardest and our very best to um, embody all of that for all people. Right. And dude, it's a labor of love. Well, and speaking of, I really want to give you the opportunity to highlight then the, the community outreach work that you do at these conferences, because this is. Uh, I mean, there are multiple things ab- about you and, and the, the companies that you've developed, the brand that you've developed uh, that are inspiring to me. But the thing that was just that really struck me the other day was your description of the community outreach that you're doing as part of these conferences. And certainly photographers are coming in and learning and growing as individuals, as business people, as photographers. But you're you're also making sure that there's plenty of focus on that outreach. What does that look like? Oh man, let me, I'm getting emotional now. Um, even as we talk about it. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me, let me tell you, Nathan, um, the reason, the reason that I'm here, Hmm. the, the only reason that Sean, that Sean exists, Sean Lee exists is because somebody invested in me. Hmm. Somebody, um, somebody saw something in me beyond beyond my point of mediocrity right mm. somebody invested in me yeah. and so i will never ever like forget those moments mm. and it is important to me as a person to give back to you know the communities that have invested in me and so there are we partner with man as an organization and uh, as a conference i make it a point to uh, partner with entities um that are doing work that serves society, you know? And so, um, we partner with the neighborhood service organization here in Detroit. Um, and they, they, they're, they're an organization that does a phenomenal job at servicing our homeless population, those that are in transition. Mm. Um, and they have a, uh, they bought a building, um, and it's called the bell building and they have 160 apartments and these apartments are fully furnished, fully stocked, kitchens, the whole nine, um, has everything that a person needs in them. And, um, they supply apartments for the homeless and give them an opportunity to, uh, transition out of homelessness back into functioning yeah. society, right? Yeah. Cause we all go through stuff. And so, Absolutely. and so as a conference, man, on that third, on that second day, that Saturday, when we are all out photo walking and, um, and and learning photography education we have a separate set of volunteers um that goes to the nso bell building and we make it a point to cater to cater in brunch um um for the bell building and we and we do care packs for um the bell building on that same day and we just go and we love on people and that's important to me i think as for the character of who we are and what we do is that I, I just don't want to be just a photography learning organization. I want to be an organization that also um, loves people, right? That's the basis of who we are and what we do yeah. um, and gives back, man. And so that has been the, every conference that we've done, we've always done it. We haven't been able to do it. We haven't, we haven't done the conference this year because of coronavirus, right. but we still um, set a date to be able to go in and, and serve uh dinner thanksgiving dinners to uh to the residents of the bell building we still still did that this year wow yeah man it it is dude it is for real and and i love every moment of it and and if we didn't do it if we didn't serve people 
I don't know if it would be, you know, I don't know if it would be worth it. Right. Some people do it for profit. Some people do it because they see an opportunity, you know, make some money, get some influence. Sure. We literally do it because, you know, one day, man, I'm going to be 85, 90 years old, God willing, you know, um, with my stomach sucked in, and I was, <laughs> yeah, you know, still, still trying to look sexy and whatever. <laughs> but, but I want to be able to hand down a uh, an industry to the next generation of creative professionals yeah. that will um, lead our world and that will have compassion and that will look out for uh, their neighbor, right? And that will give without expectation of anything in return because mm. that is just what society needs. Mm. You know, so well, and, and yeah, I think man. You, you you beautifully summed up um, there too. You know, we were talking earlier about the the belief system that drives what you do, that gives you that passion. And where I really heard it come out just now is in your description of how you benefited from those who were willing to give, who were willing to serve you in one way or another. And 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 that ultimately, you had that experience. You experienced the pain of being in a tough space of having somebody come along or a group of people come along and give you a helping hand and you want to give that same experience, that same feeling to others. And that is, that's what drives your, your passion. I think it's just a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to, and we've, we've talked about this off air, but I'm certainly looking forward to our company being involved in your conference, certainly to, to just, just hang out with you and, and, you know, help support these photographers, but also yeah. to know that we're getting involved with a conference that is that is about service in the end because man that's just so powerful and you're you're absolutely right um it, numbers are great uh but at the end of the day if we're not somehow making an impact a deep impact on someone's life in one way or another it, it really doesn't matter and I'm, I'm right there with you so i i've taken so much inspiration from you sean and, and i hope our listeners have as well maybe as we close here you can just share a few details i know theoretically or tentatively you're planning on june of this year for the conference right yes so planning on june and and i'm gonna tell you man um it's it's looking like we're we are in the middle of uh looking at coronavirus and where we are as a nation. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, what I'm looking at is um, we are looking at possibly pushing that back because okay. of fear of travel. I've uh, been, been in contact with speakers and stuff like that. And, and everybody's kind of unsure at this point. And um, the schedule as of right now for the nation is, is that most people won't even be getting shots in their arm until June, mm. as far as uh, you know, the vaccine is concerned. So, what I am, what we are actually working really hard on right now, and considering right now, potentially pushing um, back. I will let everybody know, but we are going to do uh, the Rock That virtual conference um, in May. Okay, and so, so what we'll do is possibly push push that back, depending on um, what we're looking at. We got a couple of doctors that are part of the MAP organization, um, who we are. Uh, who are we, we are consulting with and then our and and figure figure this our two co co vps co are both in the medical industry really right and yes and they've both gotten vaccines and so um they are we're, we're also consulting with them too to figure out what will be best for um the community and best for the nation and and, and we want to be responsible as far as how we go forward so um i'm looking forward to um figuring out what we're going to do, but I love the idea of doing a virtual conference in May. Hmm. Right. And, uh, having all of our speakers come on virtually and then possibly looking at a live event a little bit further, uh, back in the summer. Um, when, you know, when the nation is cleared out a little bit more. So, yeah, yeah. um, I know I, it, it, for those of you listening in, if you're listening to this later, um, we're, we're toward the end of January now, Inauguration just happened, and of course, there's talk, at least initially, of a um, hundred days, hundred million vaccines, and yeah. it's it's a it's a big goal. I mean, I certainly I'm you know I'm, every bit of me hopes that that can happen for multiple reasons, um, but it's also a big goal. And what you're saying, Sean, seems maybe a bit more realistic. June. Uh, potentially longer. We don't know. I mean, we didn't know what was going to happen last year either. So, yes, yes. And so, you know, and then, you know, with the school, with, with school and uh, we, we're going to be on campus at um, Schoolcraft College. Right. And so we're also dealing with a, uh, 
with a school and and so also getting with them and their schedule and seeing what that looks like and back to school and all of that stuff and um so yeah so we, we we're working really hard to actually get all of that stuff in but virtual conferences are something that we can do that uh, we can have every speaker in the world at right and sure. still do some of the same stuff live panels uh we can still do some outreach and some giveaways and things like that and um and introduce rock that that way so I think that would be hot. Um, and it gives us a little bit more time to make sure we plan something that's that's good. You know, um, I'm talking to hotels and stuff like that. And of course, they want us to do um, something at their hotel. But if people are still afraid of hotels and you know what I mean, yeah. um, that type of thing. So yeah. no, I, I get it. I've, I've had uh, COVID at least once now. Uh, and it's not it's not an experience. I mean, I was lucky enough yes. that it didn't affect me too seriously. I'm still missing a bunch of my taste and smell uh really and and you know i had kind of a, a lighter version of it if you will so i you know obviously my heart goes out to those who've had to deal with way more serious consequences i know it's nerve-wracking and um I, and i'm just hoping for everyone's sake that that we have some some progress we continue to see progress and uh, and that we're able to get back to some sort of normal. I mean, you know, conferences is, is wonderful because while the, the virtual, you know, the technology that we have that enables these virtual conferences and workshops that have been happening a good bit, um, there's nothing like being able to actually give somebody a hug in person and have face-to-face conversation and, yes. and, and serve in person as you were describing, Sean. So I'm hoping that that can happen soon. Nonetheless, for everybody listening in, if you just go to rockthatconference.com, you can see details and keep up with any updates. And, and certainly, Sean, I'm, I'm glad to help promote any uh, upcoming you know, changes. Or if you do that virtual conference, we'll push that out for everybody. We just remind everyone where they can follow you online, your website and social media as well. Okay. So everything um, at Sean Lee Studios, right? So SeanLeeStudios.com, Facebook, Twitter, and, um, um, and Instagram is at Sean Lee Studios. Right. And then you can um, check out MAP and the Rock That Conference, rock that, rockthatconference.com. Um, and then we love photographers.com is the MAP website. And so go ahead and take a read up and you can become a member and see all of the benefits of becoming a member of the Multicultural Association of Professional Photographers. Very good. And we'll link to all this in the show notes. Um, you can also follow MAP on Instagram. It's We Love Photogs, uh, just like it sounds. We'll link to that as well. This has been great, Sean. I really, truly appreciate uh, our new friendship. I'm looking forward to working together. I appreciate the inspiration and ultimately your willingness to, to share with all of us. Man, Nathan, you rock. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at bocapodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.